Hey. Good morning, everybody. Um, so my name is Ian Cooper. Uh, that's my Twitter handle if you want to follow me, and that's my work email if any of you actually want to get in touch with me. That's fine. So today we're going to talk about 12-factor apps. Who's heard of 12-factor apps? OK, a few of you. And if you, had you heard of it before this talk, or did that make you go and look? Yeah, OK. Um, and who's heard of the term cloud native? Talk about that a bit later. A couple of you. OK. All right, so we'll cover all that and, and talk about why it's important. This is who I am. It's not very interesting. It says I have gray in my beard. Um, the point I always draw out is the one on the bottom, which I, I got started speaking because I used to be a C++ developer. It was the very early days of .NET. And I started a user group because I wanted to go to one and there wasn't one. And then there wasn't anyone to speak, so I had to speak. But it doesn't, people who stand up here are just quite often a bit more confident or they've fallen into it. It doesn't mean that we are smarter than you guys. And all of you know things that sometimes you overlook because everyone you work with knows the same things as you. Um, but they're worth sharing with other people. And particularly if you are a more senior developer, junior developers always need people to teach them the basics. And I would encourage you all to get up and speak. The more people we have, the more different faces. The less people around the world see me and Dylan, the better. Um, so I, I would encourage you all to, to take part. This is where I work. Uh, that isn't really that important. We, we do online collaboration. We're sort of SharePoint, but we fixed SharePoint. Um, but uh, I, I don't work for a consultancy, so I have nothing to sell you. This is based on my experience of how we build apps that scale to hundreds of thousands of people. I work on an open source project. Um, we're lucky enough at Huddle to get 15% time back, and that helps to basically work on this. And this came out of, I'll show you some, some of the code today, we will use this library. So it's a CQRS framework, um, but it also supports um, the ability to handle your commands out of process, either on a task queue or between two microservices. Um, it's called Brighter, and you can go and find it online. You'll see some code today uh, that uses it. And we're always looking for people who want to um, contribute. And we're very friendly and like to help people with their first PR in the open source world. So if you've always wanted to do it, but never figured out why, come see us. We'll help you. All right, what we're going to talk about today. Um, first of all, I want to give you some context for 12-factor apps so that you can understand why it might be important to you to learn about them. OK. And then I will talk about the origins, where they, who invented them, uh, where they come from. Um, uh, and then we'll get into the 12 factors themselves. Now, well, when I first started doing this talk, I would run through all the 12 factors and give you a description of each one. It turns out with 12 factors, that doesn't give you much time for any given factor. So what I actually do now is cluster them together to give you an idea of the kind of apps that um, uh, it, it surfaces when you build them. And then we run through at the end um, the whole set of factors again so I can map them in. But I tend to divide, divide it into three groups, design factors, build and release factors, and manage factors. And we'll handle them in those clusters. OK. This slide deck, I know the conference puts it out. I also tend to make it available on my GitHub. Um, and you can get all the code we're about to see um, on GitHub as well. So you can just download that code. Um, and if any of you want to download it right now and look at the code while we go along, you should feel free. Everyone taking a picture of once one? Good. OK. One more. We good? So I just know it's irritating when you basically get to the point where you get your camera out and the presenter moves on to that next slide and you never got the clip. OK. Um, in the talk description, it mentions uh, demoing with, say, Azure Functions or AWS Lambda. I'm not going to do that. Um, I've learned that actually, since the, the, that kind of description was given, it just gets confusing. I'm just going to use Docker. It proves the same point, and it's much easier to actually dem demonstrate up here on stage. So just a warning in case that was a really important thing for you to come to this talk to see that part of it. OK. Why should you care? Okay. So 
So 12-factor apps are one of the pillars that support this idea called cloud native. Okay. Who, who's heard the term microservices? Okay. Who's bored of hearing the term microservices? Okay. Cloud native is the next term you will get bored of hearing because you will begin to hear in every presentation. We've, re we've replaced boring with microservices with boring you with cloud native. Um, so what is, what is cloud native, right? If I'm going to talk about it, what is that? Um, a better first question might be to ask what we mean by cloud. Does anyone want to have a suggestion of what they think cloud might mean? So a common one we get is, it's somebody else's machine. Um, the other one I get, uh, huge people say, is things like, uh, it, it's billed every month. Okay, and those, both, those are both true. Um, but this is a more technical definition of what we mean by cloud. And the key part to understand is that it's, it's elastic on demand and self-service. What do we mean by that? Well, we just mean that, when I want more compute instances, I just ask for them, and I get them there and then. Okay. So, I don't know, how many of you deployed to the cloud? A few. How many of you deployed to data centers? How many are kind of on-prem in your, in your own company? So, so the, the, the problem with data centers is or even on-prem, as it goes a bit like this. You decide that your application is really doing well, uh, and you need to, basically need to provide for the massive scale-up of users. Marketing has sent out that viral campaign that's finally worked. Twitter is abuzz with your application, and everyone is trying to sign in. And the problem with the world of data centers is that I phone my data center and I say, I, I could do with a few more servers. And they say, great. You can have those in about eight weeks. Oh, can you pay us the cash first, though, so we can go and buy them? In about eight weeks' time, they turn up and they install them in the rack in the data center. And I say, great, my new servers are ready. Well, no, no, you have to raise a ticket, and then we will load Windows or Unix onto your servers, and then you can have them. Okay. But that's too late. Right? Everyone came to my servers as a result of that marketing campaign, and they couldn't get on. The service basically responded badly. Twitter went from what a great new service to these guys can't scale, and we lost out. Right? And that's the problem with the traditional model, is that it has no elasticity. And it, you can't suddenly say, I need new resources, and I need them now. And it may even apply to much smaller scale things, like particular, just small, tiny problems you get at a period of time. So um, one of the things Huddle does is we look after your content and we give you kind of previews of that content and we will do that for video. So we work with various media organizations and some of them upload huge files which they then want to distribute around to people to, say for example, to edit. And if we get a sudden wave of those hitting us, it can, doing all that video conversion takes a lot of processing power. And we can't say to all our other customers, why don't you go and make a cup of tea and sit down, put your feet up, because we've got to get through these guys' videos first, right? So we have to bring online more resources to process that work. There is also an issue with cloud around operational expenditure versus capital expenditure, and that's that um, with traditional data center models, I have to have the money before I get the revenue, I have to go and buy the servers. Whereas with operational expenditure, I can get income coming in before I have to pay the bill for it. And that made me make a lot more sense. Um, so that tends to be why people go to the cloud. Long term, actually, the cloud can be more expensive uh, than being hosted in a data center. But the elasticity is a considerable benefit. So when people talk about building cloud native applications, what they really mean is building applications that are designed to run in that kind of environment, right? Elastic, on-demand, and self-service. But more than that, it's applications that are designed to exploit that environment, right? Applications that are built around the idea that they will scale and they will be provisioned on demand. So we have to have a maturity model because software is full of maturity models. This one comes from Pivotal. 
and it describes basically what they see as the maturity model of your cloud journey. Um, so I disagree with that a little bit. I, 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 so they, they, they put microservices and API first design as kind of the, the highest level you can achieve. Uh, and I would disagree with that. I'd say actually microservices and API first design are useful whether you're hosted in a data center, on-prem, or in the cloud. But I think more useful are the other parts. So Cloud Ready kind of says, I am going to lift and shift into the cloud. What changes do I have to make to my application just to make that work? And I'm going to have to remember things like, you know, I'm, I'm bringing up ephemeral instances, right? So remember the cloud is, is built like this. They get a shipping container, and they put in that shipping container the cheapest commodity hardware they can find. And that stuff just breaks all the time. And when about half the boxes inside the shipping container fail, take the container out of the farm, put a new one in, take that away, salvage the kit that they can, and restore the container. So kit fails all the time. So you can't rely on things like the disk on your EC2 instance. So you start to rely on something like your S3 storage, because that's going to have the uptime that you need. So you have to change some of your basic strategy. When you get to cloud friendly, then you're starting to say, hey, this environment offers me new opportunities around elasticity. And that's when 12-factor apps you can see come in, uh, along with things like horizontal scaling. And then we go beyond that, we start to get to cloud resilient. Cloud resilient means suddenly I'm dealing with multiple availability zones. Whereas before, when I was running on a rack, this, people talked about cap theorem to me and said, you know, um, consistency, availability, partition, tolerance, it went over my head because I was running on a rack. And frankly, if you're on a rack, quite often, if it's bad enough, the rack's on fire, you don't care about cap theorem. But suddenly you're having to deal with partitions in your network between two availability zones, and it's a real thing for you. So then you get into cloud resilience, and that finally leads you towards cloud native. Okay, that's the model. Okay. And you may say to me, uh, well, I'm not deploying to cloud, so how useful you, is your guidance to me? Well, the other big shift that's happening right now is to people deploying via containers. And increasingly, a lot of these guidelines begin to apply when you want to run in containers as well. Now. Amazon estimates that the average EC2 instance has about 50% utilization. That means you're really only using about 50% of the capacity of the box when you're deployed to it. That means that about half the money you give to Amazon, you give them for doing nothing. So there's a big drive to try and increase the utilization of a box by running more things on your instance until you reach its capacity. And a lot of what when people talk about things like Kubernetes, et cetera, they're trying to do is to say, if I treat all of that as a kind of virtualized environment, then what I can do is distribute my apps in containers amongst that virtualized environment, such that where if I have a lot of work, I can move stuff off a busy server onto a quieter server, right? And it's about utilizing the pool that you create for yourself more efficiently. So the way that we use resources like AWS is changing. We're beginning to move towards a model where you're provisioning your EC2 instances to run containers on them. And of course, um, you can always run, as developers, we can run containers in certain environments as well. But the key thing is that essentially what we're looking at again is a model where we're saying, I want to be elastic. I may want to spin up new instances of a particular process that's, that, that, that's under load. On, amongst my pool of resources that I can choose from. I may want to um, do that rapidly, right? And so it's just the same model, but it's just being applied at a slightly different level. You're dealing with containers rather than instances. And the other thing you may have heard about is serverless, right? And serverless is really just a, a, con a pool of containers for running your application that are maintained by the cloud provider rather than you. And they serve you an instance out of that pool. Your code runs. When your code finishes running, it gets handed back to the pool. You may or may not ever get to, see, to, to understand you're reusing the same machine between calls. But again, we're just talking about increasing utilization. And 12-factor apps as a series of set design guidelines are very useful if you're running in containers and you're running in containers in a way that essentially uh, lets you be, be elastic. So if you can take one thing away as to why you would use 12-factor apps, 
elasticity is really the thing that you are searching for here. Okay. So though I don't expect to read the text on that slide, that's just basically a screen grab of the front page of the site 12factor.net. So 12factor.net is where, is where you can go and see all the principles written down. It was created by Heroku. So Heroku, were, they started out as a platform as a service provider for Ruby developers, and now they're a more generic um, hosting solution. But they went away and said, some people are successful at building applications that run in our environment, some people less so. What guidance could we figure out from the people that are successful about how you should build up applications for the cloud? And the result of that, well, particularly by a guy called Adam Wiggins, uh, who was working at Heroku at the time, um, was this t set of 12 factors. Okay. So these are the 12 factors. So I, I divide the 12 factors up a little bit. I've just color coded them just for ease. So um, the green ones, I think about as design time constraints. They affect how you're going to design your application. Okay. Uh, the blue ones, I tend to think about as build con constraints. They talk really about how we turn our software into actual artifacts or where we store our, 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 our source code. And the red ones, I think about as runtime factors. They're things that we have to think about when our application is running. Okay. And um, I'm not going to read through that list right now. What we'll do is we'll see that list again at the end, and I'm going to talk about some of the factors. So we'll start with the ones in green, the design factors. Then we'll move on to the blue ones, and we'll cover the red ones lightly. Okay. So when you are thinking about designing your application, what are the constraints that you need to bear in mind? So the first one is called port binding. So we say export services via port binding. What does that mean? It means that essentially when you run your app, it's going to talk to the outside world via a port and return responses over that port. What does that mean? Well, the, the simplest instance, and we'll see some code shortly that will give us an example, is if you think about a self-hosted ASP.NET app, right? You are running essentially in a console. You are spinning yourself up, and you say, I'm going to listen on a port, port 5000 or whatever, for messages. Okay. And that enables something very interesting, which is, if I just spin up and listen to a port, it's very easy to create new instances of me and essentially give me an address and just basically expose the port on whatever container or instance I am in. So it makes it very easy under this model to create new instances of me. We say HTTP, but actually there are a number of protocols you can speak over a port and it's, this particular guideline still makes sense. You might just be talking with sockets. You might be talking AMQP, for example, to a um, RabbitMQ broker and, and sending messages instead. But the key idea is that your application says, here are some ports and I talk over them, right? And for the outside world, just has to know to hook you up. I need you to hook things up to the ports and then you're good to go. Um, interesting enough, in architecture, you know, the, we talk about components and connectors at a high level, and can, all those components connectors working across ports. So this is a very, you know, traditional model. Um, and you should be self-hosted. Right? Don't be hosted inside a container. Talk about why, just why in a second. So you spin up, you start listening on a port, effectively, and you respond on it. But the key thing we want to do is avoid hosting an application container like IIS. So the key reason for this guidance is to stop you doing that. Let's talk a little bit about why. So this is, who's familiar with IIS, most of you? Okay. So this is IIS. So what happens is a request comes in from the internet. We go via basically HTTP sys, which is a kernel level component, and we go to the Windows Activation Service, and we read the application host.config, and we say, who handles this request? 
When we figure out who handles this request, essentially via the worldwide publishing services, we spin up basically a W3 worker process and say, here's your code, let's launch basically your application. Um, uh, and there are various models we could do with app pools and the number of threads we can have, web gardens, web forms we can configure. It's not that relevant. But essentially, your application is hosted via IIS, which then answers the request to the outside world. Okay. This is a container. So we have a Docker host, and the Docker host has a Docker daemon on it, and the Docker daemon essentially talks to the outside world via a REST API. And the CLI infrastructure, the command line infrastructure for Docker, which works with things like Docker files for declarative instruction around what we want, says, I am going to essentially call the Docker daemon. So traditionally, to spin up a new container, I essentially do a Docker run, I pass it the Docker file, which describes declaratively what my requirements are to host my application. We go away and grab an image from a Docker registry, might be Docker Hub, pull that down, create an instance of the container. And each container is best to think of essentially as a sandboxed process, right? Don't think really of Docker containers as virtual machines. They're much lighter weight than that because they share the underlying kernel. But the key idea is it's sandboxed. So I can run, but, when, but if I crash, etc., I won't destroy other instances on the machine. Now, we've had instances, for example, at Huddler, where traditionally under Windows, quite often what happens is you run multiple you know, endpoints in IIS on one server, even multiple backend services. But the problem with that is they're not sandboxed. And so we've had runaway video conversion processes that have essentially consumed all the memory on the machine and taken out everything else that's also running on that machine next to it. You don't want that to happen. You want to be sandboxed, be able to limit what resources that application can use so that you are a better neighbor and you share more effectively. Okay. So this world actually has some significant technical advantages over this world. It doesn't make any sense if I have a container to load IIS inside it. Because I'm loading containers in containers, right? I've got an application container that I'm loading inside a container. This model already provides you with that containerized model. So that tends to be the reason why people say expose ports, because it's an easy model to map. My, inside my container, I just say I expose some ports. I can either talk to other containers running inside the same host, or the host can expose my port and map it out to consumers on the outside. And spinning up new instances is therefore trivial. Okay. All right. Treat backing services as attached resources. What does that mean? Well, backing services are just the things that my app needs to talk to. Um, so that could be a database where we want to store some data. It could be a message queue, which I'm using to communicate with other, other services. But we also actually mean things like the file system. Uh, and we also mean, for example, if you decide to cache things in memory, the cache. And the danger really with both cloud and container environments with this model is that if you try and use local resources, bear in mind that they will disappear on you. If I am in a serverless environment and I get a container given to me out of the pool, it, I have it for the lifetime of servicing that HTTP request. And while I can write code that accesses the file system, if I had a thing I store there, well, at the end of my request, that goes back to the pool. It may be destroyed, it may not be, but on the next request, I have no guarantee that it will be there on the file system. Some people do cheat, they just keep trying writing stuff to every file system they receive, but it's not a very good model. You should assume that that file system on that container instance is going to go away. The same is really true of your EC2 instance. So I can provision an instance in the cloud, then that instance is, like I say, cheap hardware and designed to fail. So it's going to go away at some point, and anything that was stored locally on the server will vanish with it. If I have in-process memory on my machine, and I'm using that as some kind of cache, I have the same set of problems. If it's a container, and it comes out of the pool again, then probably it hasn't got anything stored in, the, in memory in that machine. 
So I have to think about all these things that I might have been able to rely on living on my actual server as being very transient and only available to me for the lifetime of the request. And if I want things to exist across requests, I have to rely on some kind of external service. So for a file system, I might talk to S3 or some kind of blob storage. Or I might mount, say, for example, an EBS volume in AWS to say, here I want something that's actually going to be permanent that I can keep calling back to. And for a cache, I might want a service like ElastiCache or spin up my own Redis instance or memcached, a distributed cache so that I can actually rely on and talk to. So everything that I want to use from my app needs to be a service that has been provisioned somewhere. It can't just be something that lives on my local box. Okay. Let me have a... All right, so we have a quick demo, mainly because you're probably all bored of hearing me just talk. Um, so I'm going to talk to you. This, this, you can get this sample code for this app, and we'll go through it in some... We'll come back to this about two or three times. Uh, and I will do two things. One is I will demonstrate to you the bits that are relevant to the talk, but I'll also give you a little bit of a map through the code in case you want to play with this in your own time and have a look at how it's done. So this is just a standard .NET Core app, and what we're looking at here is essentially how we spin this up, right? And this just uses Kestrel, and it's self-hosted. So we're essentially just writing a console application that I can run at the command line, when I spin it up, it will start listening on port 5000. Remember we said basically the way our application works is it binds to a port and it takes traffic over that port. So that's all this is going to do. When we run it, the spin up, it'll say, hello, I'm a Kestrel a web server and I'm going to listen on port 5000. Now in production, you probably want to stick your Kestrel web server behind Nginx or HAProxy because you want to do things like you know, SSL termination or uh, uh, compression, uh, proxying. But for the purpose of this demo, we're just going to do it raw because we, because we don't need the other parts. Okay. A couple other things to show you in here. So obviously, I needed to have a demo application. Uh, and so I decided that the app, everyone writes Hello World. So clearly, what I needed to write was the world's most over-engineered Hello World application. So I take in post requests with greetings and allow you to query them out of the database. Okay. And to show you here, because this looks this could be like a bit a bit confusing, so we're just using this CQRS framework writer. We divide the world up into commands, things that change the state of the world, and queries, things that ask for the state of the world. Um, uh, and there's lots of advantages to doing that, particularly the query model can be much, much simpler because it doesn't have to worry about domain restrictions. So here on the post side, we say we're going to create a command to add a greeting. And then this command processor just says, I've got a command, and I want you to handle that. We are all async, of course, right? .NET Core, uh, SP.NET Core gives us the ability to be using async. That obviously uh, means that we are much more efficient because our thread can service other requests when we are I.O. bound. Most web applications spend a considerable part of the part of their time I/O bound, and so we get a lot of the speed advantages now that we've seen in, thing, in environments like Node.js. Okay, so that command is over here. Very simple data structure with our message, "Hello world," the like. Okay, and that command process just routes this to a handler. And the handler is very simple. It just creates basically entity framework context. We have a repository wrapping some of those entity framework API elements. But all we're really doing is just adding a new greeting into the database. Okay. Just for info, it's not an important part of this talk. But what we do in Brighter is let you build a pipeline so that you can handle the orthogonal elements. So here we're letting you do retries and circuit breakers and all the good reliability stuff by integrating poly into your pipeline. It's just a feature but it's not part of this talk. Okay. And so the other thing we're doing over on the greetings controller is when we get that result back, we query it. There's also a similar query up here. And so Docker, which is a sister of Brighter, is uh, just our query handler. And again, that's a query. It just says, I want to find something by ID. And the handler for that here would be pretty much what you expect. Spin up an entity framework context and just use a link statement 
to pull out the matching record, right? So it's a, it's a very over-engineered Hello World application. Okay. Now, when we run this, we're going to use Docker. This is a Docker Compose file. Docker Compose is great for working in development environments. What Docker Compose is going to do is say, I've got a couple of Docker containers. I will create a network so they can talk to each other. We have here the database and the web server. Okay. What's interesting about this in terms of what we're talking about is you can see that we're, we have an explicit line for ports. So we're saying take port 5000 on the container and expose it to the outside world as port 5000. We could remap that and put something else. But you can see the advantage of our app being communicating by ports is it starts to work with this inf declarative infrastructure. We're saying, I talk to world on port 5000. If you expose me on port 5000, I can talk to everybody outside. Okay. My SQL is effectively just being used over SQL Server here because it's got a smaller footprint in Docker. You'll also see, and we'll come back to this later in more detail, but you'll notice that we are using environment variables to control the environment-specific elements that we need as connection strings. Okay. Back up in the startup file for this project, you can see that we are given via .NET Core the ability to add environment variables. What that lets us do is, rather than using the traditional approach of reading from a config file, it lets us essentially read those variable pieces of information that vary by environment via environment variables. And I'll talk about why that's important a bit later, but I just wanted to draw your attention to it right now. Okay. So. Um, there's a Docker file, which I'll just show you briefly for this one there. The only reason this is really worth looking at is just, again, to emphasize. We're saying we're going to expose a port. We're going to listen on that port for requests, and we're going to run some .NET code in response to that. OK. Make sure I'm not running anything. Good. So there's a build file for this application. Um, it's a very simple build, uh, but it just puts the stuff in the out, so if you out in an out directory, and we then use that when we're building from Docker. I built this in an older school way with Docker in a sense that I build it locally and then create a Docker container. Docker now has this two-stage build process. At some point, I'll alter the code online to use that approach instead because it's simpler. Um, but just if you get this down, play with it yourself. Just remember to do the build first. We'll get some errors. I may forget during this talk, in which case we will get some errors. Right, and then to run the Docker Compose file, I'm just going to do Docker Compose up. I haven't got it in my history. Docker. So I'm saying Docker Compose up. It, I mean, I've got the default name for the Docker Compose file, so I don't have to give it the name of the file. Um, and I'm going to tell it to build so it's going to pull down a whole load of images, and it's going to essentially create the containers from those images. The big one spraying a lot of information everywhere is MySQL. Um, some of you probably can't see, but down the very bottom, it's saying to us, I'm now listening on HTTP 5000, right? So I'm listening on a port for requests. And we should be able to see that working. So I'm just using a tool called REST Client to send REST requests in Visual Studio Code. So I'm just going to essentially say, what have we got in there already? Um, I've already got my message in there in the database. So I'm going to send a new message. I'm going to send hello world. So I'll do a post request. Post request will go across to the server. It says, uh, there we go, hello world. That's interesting. All right, do you send request to get them back? Well, I only got one. Hello, Alice. It's interesting. Let's try this one. I'm getting hello, Alice, back all the time. That's a bit weird. Uh, OK, not quite sure why I'm not getting all of them back today. It's a bit weird. OK, we'll sort that out in a second. Um, but the idea, effectively, is that I can post a new request in and get back a response. Let's just see what's happening over here. OK, so hold up. Requests have gone in. Model state is valid. You can see that we're essentially handling a range of requests via basically that port over here. Okay. Right. So I'll have it later. Okay. Let's 
Let's go back to the slides. I mean, let me remember to shut this down, otherwise. Okay. Right. Let's keep. Oh, start. No. Current slide. Okay, let's talk about processes and concurrency. So another rule is execute the app as one or more stateless processes. Now the key idea is that we want to be stateless. So this is a funny word, right? Because it implies that I have no state. It's a bit like serverless, it's a funny word. A better word perhaps is state aware. Okay. We say, actually what I want to do is be aware that when I have some state, I need to save that away at the end of the request. And if I need to look at that state on a new request, load it from some kind of database. What I don't want to do is use a sticky session. The problem with sticky sessions is that they mean that every single time I have to come into the same uh, server. And the problem with that is it's very hard for me then to elastically increase my ability to handle requests. If I get a sudden flood of requests coming in and they're all sticky and that first server becomes overwhelmed, adding new servers will help me with future traffic, but it won't help distribute the existing traffic I've got because everyone's going to keep coming back to that same server. So sticky requests are kind of our enemy. What we want to do is say, I want to be stateless. When the request comes in, then I will retrieve anything I need to retrieve to handle that request from data storage. And if you're worried about the cost of going, for example, to your you know, SQL Server instance, then the other alternative is to use something like Redis, which is in process and is in process memory rather than effectively being on disk. And so it's very fast to call, right? But you don't want to be. To, you don't want to defeat any elasticity you build into your application by making it impossible to scale out by adding new numbers. Okay. The other thing to bear in mind is that although we may have or want to think about HTTP requests a lot, there may be other kind of workloads we want to deal with. And generally the model is if we have different workloads, use different processes. And the real reason for that is that if I have a process that we uh, wants to handle long-running work, then it may be that I want fewer or more instances of that than the HTTP process. The two of them may not want to scale in the same way. Okay. And the more I can control what I need new instances of, because I'm able to say things doing that kind of work need scaling up, the better. Putting it all in one big process means the only thing I can do is scale that monolithic process. If I have lots of processes, I get much more fine-grained control about what I need to scale to improve the performance of my app. So let's take a typical example of offloading work. I might find in a typical web application that at some points in the day, I'm going to experience a peak of demand. Say, for example, everybody in uh, what happens to us is about three or four in the afternoon, UK time, we have UK users online and the US then comes online. And at that point, we have a kind of peak amount of users entered into the system. And it will drop off again as the UK starts to go home. Um, and it'll have a few other peaks as various parts of the US come online. During one of those peaks, we might find that the system can become sluggish. Typical things that happen are, for example, you run out of uh, DB connections in the DB connection pool. Okay. You haven't allocated enough, and suddenly you have huge numbers of requests trying to talk to the database, which tends to be your bottleneck. So the web servers then enter a problem state. Because I have basically run out of connection pools, I tend to often quite queue for long periods of time waiting for them. That tends to mean that my web server is now using threads in order to manage all these queuing requests. And eventually, it will start to queue requests at the front end and enter a yellow screen of death. We get kind of a cascading failure. Now, we can try and fix that with things like circuit breakers. 
But the point is we can get this chain thread that takes out the whole application. And generally speaking, we want to have kind of rules that say we never want to be in this place. So we have a typical rule which says you have to respond to web requests within 300 milliseconds. If the work is going to take you longer than that, I'm going to have to do something else with it. So a task queue is a typical idea we use in web development to try and solve the problem of having some work which is going to take too long to process in the web server because it will tie up resources that deny future requests coming to my website. Okay? I want you all to come visit my website and have a great experience, but if you're doing something long running, I don't need to block other users. So what I want to do is offload that work to another process that essentially won't block my requests. And if I do that using a message queue, a piece of message oriented middleware, for example, RabbitMQ, I can actually begin to co I can con consume that work at a rate that I can manage. So if I'm receiving huge numbers of requests that are exceptionally expensive on the database, lots of people wanting to add stuff suddenly, I can just say at the front end, hey, I've got your request, I issued 202 accepted. And in the link header I say, and here is a link you can follow. And when you follow that link, you'll find either basically a progress endpoint that says, I've done 60% of your job, or whatever the number is, or actually the resource that you wanted to create, and it would be 404 until it's finally created, at which point essentially you'll get a redirect to the actual resource, or it'll be there. Okay. And what that means is that I can now process the work on the queue at a rate which my database will cope with. I have effectively throttled my application and said, you are going too fast for the database, but it doesn't matter because I've taken that work and I've put it on a queue. And the queue, if we set it up right, has something called guaranteed delivery, right? It says, once I have the work, I promise to give you the work. I'll store it to disk. I'll distribute it across a number of nodes in the cluster. Your consumer will get that. Sometimes we have guaranteed at least once, and that tends to mean in order to make that guarantee to you, there's a risk you might get the message twice. So have a look for that and throw it away. You can actually support guaranteed exactly once as well, but it's just more complicated. All right. So the, the front end comes in and says, the work is going to take me too long. I want to put it on a queue, and I want to respond to the user 202, put the work on a queue, and a back end process reads that off and says, OK, I'm, I'm good. All right, so we'll show you that. So we've got a project here called Greetings Worker. You don't want to look at all the detail in Greetings Worker. But what I will show you is just this bit down the bottom. So what we get out of Brighter is the ability to, in a console application, do something a bit like Web Host Builder. We're setting up a host and we're saying, effectively, we want to listen for communication across a port. And in this case, the port essentially is the default one that MQP provides. We haven't overridden it. What we're saying is, <coughs> on that port, we want to subscribe to, uh, to the messages that have this routing key. We want you to put it on this given uh, channel or queue. We will then read from that particular queue messages that come in our direction. Okay. And what happens here is that we now in our add greeting command handler, when we've received a new greeting, what we're going to do is we're going to say, we're going to post, and that's just in Brighter, that just means put it on a queue, a regreet message. And that will go over the queue, and our worker will consume it off the queue. Okay? And uh, the regreet handler runs in the context of that worker process, and we'll just spit out some stuff to say I have received essentially uh, that copy of that message. Now notice that we are using the same domain model and database. Although there are two processes for handling different workloads, we consider it to be the same bounded context. In microservices terms, this is still one service. We just have multiple processes, and we have multiple processes so that we can scale the work differently. 
Okay. So, oh, low battery. Um, guys, have you got? Can I use one of the plugs at the bottom down here? Can I plug in somewhere? I don't want to pull plugs out your socket without, um... Oh, okay, cool. Cheers, Gov. Thank you. Yeah, we got power, cool. Right. So I'm just going to build that application. When you build things, when you're standing up here, it always seems like an eternity. Uh, when you're building it, uh, sitting down, preparing a talk, it just seems to be very fast. And now, look, it's going so slowly as it builds. Um, it's not doing very much. Okay. Right, let me clear that. Oh, yeah, what I will show you, I'll spin it up first just in case it takes a while, but and then I'll just show you the different Docker, com the Docker Compose file has changed. Right. So now in a Docker Compose file, we have essentially a worker process as well. Okay. Again, it's very similar. We've essentially, we've got the web process, the work process, and we've also got Rabbit. So Rabbit's just our broker. And you can see, again, we're using environment variables so that I find the broker by using a broker variable, essentially, which points to this broker, right? And it's essentially using the name there, which we set there. All right, and Greetings Worker itself will have a Docker file. Um, and you can see this fairly straightforward. We just basically run the application. It's consuming from a queue over a port. It doesn't need to expose a port itself, um, but it reads from a port. Okay. Right, so we got basically, you can see Rabbit and a worker now started as well as um, uh, somewhere up here. If we're lucky, there'll be a web started somewhere ages ago. Yeah, there you go. Okay. All right, so. Now, I'm a bit worried, by the way, it wasn't quite working perfectly earlier, but we'll see. So when I send a request now, I don't know why I'm getting back hello, Alice, every time. It's a bit concerning. You can see that the work, I don't know if you can see the bottom, this is the bottom of the screen. I'll do a few more so it moves up. But you can see, essentially, we've received a message from the worker now saying hello, Alice. So the web executed. You can see the line saying the web's executed effectively to deal with that message. And you can see it sent a message. So over here, you can see some information saying from the workers saying we received a message from the queue. That's what the message looks like in the raw. So essentially that's rabbit MQ message headers in a JSON body. And here you can see it being processed. So if I send a few more messages. Everybody's at Alice today for some reason I don't understand. It's Dylan with that song last night. He's doomed us all. But you can see that we're essentially processing all that information on the worker. So we've offloaded work from the web and put it on the worker. All right. Let me just close this. And we'll start to pull a few bits together so you can see how this all kind of makes some sense in a second. OK. Question at the back. Did you say that again? I didn't quite hear. All right. How did I get the reference to the worker process in my main web server? Is it, is it dependency? Yeah, I'll show you. So 
Over here in like, my Docker Compose file, uh, you can see that on my web, I have an environment variable set called broker. Rabbit has a AMQP syntax, which is a bit like an HTTP syntax, which says I'm going to talk the AMQP protocol. I want to go to greetings broker, which essentially is the host name I gave to that application. The Docker Compose creates a local network inside the host, and so I, you can see other things on the same network. So it's saying on port 5672, Rabbit will be there on that on greetings broker, and so the web knows to talk to that. Then within my um, application, you don't want to see all of this because the configuration is the only bit of this which gets hairy, but we will tell it in here somewhere, uh, so I can find it quickly. Uh, we say, go to basically and find the broker at this URI. So we say that's a messaging gateway, and we're going to find the broker there. Okay, and that's the name of the exchange you want to use. Make sense? Cool. Um, Writer is really well documented for an open source project. So if you get that code and go and look at Writer's documentation, we do explain all of how it works. Okay. Play from current slide. Uh, okay. So. There are a couple of ways we can think about scaling in applications, right? I can add more threads. The trouble with adding more threads, although it can be very effective, is it's very difficult for anything outside to help manage demand. If I use a process and I say, hey, I've got this process that effectively acts as a web server or a, or, or a queue worker, something outside can easily say, Let's just create a new instance of that process because there's demand. I'm looking at the length of the queue. The queue length is getting too long. I've got a rule that says start up a new worker process. Okay. I'm receiving a lot of traffic on my, uh, on my HTTP request. My servers are really busy. I'm going to start up a new web process. It's much harder from outside to say start a new thread inside your process. So we prefer to scale via the process model. Now, it turns out people who do, do say Python or Ruby have been doing this all along anyway, or even Node, because they don't support threads very well. .NET's got some great threading support, um, but it doesn't really begin to help you so much in this kind of environment where it's easier in a containerized world to think about every container as a sin single sandbox process, and you want to basically spin up new containers to service requests. And that new container is essentially one new process instance. Right? So you just need to start focusing on saying, it's better for me to spin up a process now than it is to spin up a thread to handle more work. Create a new instance of my application, use a container that's lightweight wrapped around it, and that will effectively let me scale. Um, so yeah, don't worry about that last point. That's, a, that's kind of a bit trivial. Okay. In order to make this work, we need to maximize robustness with a fast startup and a graceful shutdown. It's no good me saying, I'm going to introduce a new process when the work comes online, and it'll start in about 10 minutes. Okay. This is one of the problems a little bit with Windows in a kind of cloud environment, is that quite often the startup time is very long. Whereas the advantage of something like Unix is it's fast. One nice thing about uh, containers in .NET Core is they're a lot faster than containers in Java. Right, because Java has quite slow startup times on some of its containers. So I want to be able to quickly bring something new online and say, hey, I want to start it up quickly. Okay. I need to stop gracefully. As well as bringing up capacity, I might want to take capacity down. Right? We don't tend to have a huge amount of traffic at 2 or 3 in the morning. That's time I'm paying for because I'm renting server space. Why wouldn't I just take that down so I'm not really providing anything at all? Serverless is the ultimate example of this, right? If no one's calling me, I'm not running anything. I'm not paying for time where I'm not being used. To do that, I have to stop, gra I have to stop gracefully. What do I mean by stop gracefully? Well, it tends to mean when someone tells me basically to end my process, I need to think about what I'm going to do with any work that's in flight. And there are really two options. One option is, it's going to take me ages to shut everything down. I'm just going to kill everything. 
And that can work. If I'm reading from a queue, generally the queue I might want to say, I act the message when I'm done doing the work. And so it will be taken off the queue. If I don't act it and my process goes away, eventually the broker might say, no one ever dealt with that piece of work. I'll make it available again to another consumer. Okay, so it can work. But generally, I prefer to use a model which says, stop taking new work and run out all the existing work. So close off the entry gate, say, hey, I'm shutting down. I'm not taking any more requests, but I will let the ones I've currently got play out. And Bright will do that for you. Um, but this enables the elastic scaling, right? So this is called the competing consumer model. Remember we talked about this idea of saying, hey, I want to basically have a whole queue of long-running work. It turns out that sometimes I can go faster than just one consumer can handle, still safely, and not overwhelm my database. So in that case, I can introduce new instances of my worker process to help me eat through that queue faster. And sometimes you get peaks, right? A whole lot of work came in, we put it all in the queue, but now we've got a big queue. We want to eat that queue down so we can go back to a smaller number of consumers in the long run. So we scale up the worker processes temporarily, we eat through the queue backlog, and then we scale down at the end so we're not using resources that don't, we don't need to reuse. Okay, so let me show you that one. So. So what we'll show you is that this is relatively straightforward with something like containers. Because if I just do scale docker compose, I'm literally saying to it, I want you to bring up more workers. In fact, I can actually do this while it's running because I'm trying to show you the log output at the same time. It's a bit harder for me. But if I did it on silent, I could just introduce scale and say, bring in some more workers. And what you should see is that we're creating more workers now. And if we're lucky, we'll be able to read the color coding that we get for different workers. Sometimes it chooses colors that are so hideous that it's actually not visible on screen. So a quick prayer to the demo gods may be required. OK. Look at three. One of the things to bear in mind here is that when you're doing this kind of work is that um, different servers start up, a, you can put dependencies between them in Docker to say, start this server basically before this server because I depend on it. But that doesn't necessarily that helpful because Rabbit's still going to have to start on the server before it starts receiving requests. So you need to make sure that your application code, however it's written, says, if I'm waiting for this other resource to spun up, it may not be ready yet, I'm going to have to enter some kind of retry loop. Um, and you have to handle that kind of work yourself. Okay. So I think we are good to go. Let me get my testing tool up. Now in theory, if I fire off a whole load of requests, what we should see is a range of workers handling them. So. You can see here we've got worker three, you can see here we've got worker two, you can see here we've got worker one. And so what's happening is we're distributing it amongst those workers. What's happening is there's just a queue, and if I, each worker comes in and says, I'll have the next item on the queue. And while it's processing it, the next worker that comes along gets given the next item in the queue up, because this one's already been locked by an existing consumer, right? So that enables us to distribute that work across the queue. We could do the same thing with web traffic, right? I could have scaled up the web and fired more requests. It's just harder to demo here. But um, uh, the same thing is true. You could essentially just scale up. And you could, particularly if you have something like Nginx in front, you put Nginx in front of your Kestrel application. In Nginx, you essentially say, I declare an upstream group. And in that upstream group is your pool of servers. And then Nginx will load balance across your range of servers for you. All right, let's just do a few more of those. A whole load. There you go. You can see a whole load of stuff. So different workers keep taking that request. All right. Cool. All right. That's the kind of last demo we're, we're going to get today. Um, 
I'm going to be a bit faster at the end. So the, the, I focus on the design factors a bit because they're often the most significant. How long have I got? I'm out. Can I, can I just do really quick? Two minutes. Um, Because it's the design factors that basically will affect most of you during your day-to-day -day work. You have to start thinking about building apps in a different way. All right, let's just run through this quite quickly. So generally, have one repo, put all of your code in the same repo. Even if you have multiple processes, if it's one CI boundary, you put all the code in the same place. Okay. Um, our dependencies ought to be declared in a way that means essentially we can, get, we can put ourselves into a given container that's clean and just pull down what we need. We need to avoid things like the GAC. We don't want to actually share things betw uh, between different applications. We should have one process in our container. And that means we isolate ourselves to only the dependencies required for our application to work. Now, as with new GET, we have that model very easily. Um, Python has to use things like virtual environments. And we have a simple model, which is I clone from the repo, I restore essentially my dependencies, I can build and I can run. Okay. Store config in the environment. Well, you saw me doing that, right? You saw effectively I was using environment variables rather than a config file. So the idea is that essentially we should use we should not use a configuration file because our build artifact ought to be immutable. It should be the same thing that progresses through various stages, particularly if I'm deploying into a Docker container. Okay? And so instead of that, um, you want to use something that you can say, in this environment, what is different? Environment variables work. They do have a security risk, and that's that a trace will put your environment variables out, which might contain secrets. What a lot of people actually do in production is use a config server. So you get something like console or any kind of key value store will really do, and you say to it, where is my broker? Right? And a number of these values are changing anyway. In a dynamic environment like the cloud or containers, they're probably not consistent. You may not know where all the instances of, of the application live. So it's often better to ask in that environment a server to say to you, well, where is basically the, the, the queue? Where are my, uh, all my consumers living? Okay. So try and move away from your classic web.config file, et cetera. Um, strictly separate your stages. In other words, what we're saying is you should have a distinct stage, essentially, that says build, and a distinct stage that says run. Right? Uh, that's fairly common nowadays, but didn't used to be in quite the same way. OK, quick summary. So that's all the 12 factors. The three at the bottom um, I, I didn't really talk about. I just mentioned them briefly. Keep development stage and production as similar as possible. That means, not, that means not only in terms of I want you to deploy to an environment which looks like my other environments, um, but it also means don't have too long a time window. Don't have your development uh, version of the code base six months away from what's current in production. Too confusing. Treat logs as event streams. If I have multiple processes running in containers, I cannot log anymore to their local hard drive. Collating that information alone would be bad, but much of it is ephemeral. So treat your log as a stream and use something like the Elk stack with basically Kibana to collect all your logs into one place where you can review them. That means you want to use structured logging so you can essentially have logs that all have the same shape and things like correlation IDs to make it easy to search and trace requests through. And run admin management tasks as a one-off process just means if I've got CLI tooling from my database migration scripts, keep it in the same repo as the code. All right. Thanks very much, guys. Sorry I overran. <laughs>